you know. All right, let me share my screen. And here we go. Can you see that okay, Mr. Shragi? All right, so yep, just, our audience can as well. Thank you. So this is our evening community forum. Uh, we'll talk a little bit tonight about what's needed for a full reopening. Uh, we'll talk about a timeline for a full reopening. And uh, we'll talk about what we anticipate the guidelines for a full reopening will say. And as I said, we'll save a little time for questions at the end. Now, let's talk a little bit about our COVID numbers first, though. This is a student graph. And if you've watched board meetings, you see me present this every Monday at our board meetings. And uh, this has been happening since we came back from the holiday recess. Again, this is students. The gray line is quarantine. The red line is isolation. Remember, isolation means these are students that had COVID. And the gray line are students who might have been exposed to COVID. And you'll see after the holiday break, there was a little bit of a jump, but it was a steady decline after that. Uh, you can see some spikes in quarantine here and there because sometimes a class might be quarantined. And that's a large number of, of students and that jumps up. Uh, or, or it could have been a large family that might have been quarantined or a couple families and, and it can really affect the numbers that way. But you'll see it's been, as I said, a steady decline. Uh, when we had February, February break and came out of February break, we saw a little bit of a uptick again. Uh, and that has me con concerned about next week and spring break. And, you know, certainly don't want to see those trends go in that direction again, because you'll see before February break, we're actually, um, you know, fairly low. And now you can see heading into spring break, our quarantines anyway are climbing again. Uh, we did have a few days last week where we had no cases of uh, COVID for students, uh, but we have three now today, uh, three cases amongst our students and we have 23 students in, in quarantine. One thing to note though is uh, what's not reflected are presumed positive cases of COVID. So in other words, if I were to wake up and I didn't feel good, I kind of felt like I had the flu and I didn't have a uh, smell or taste uh, and I called my doctor, they may tell me, <clears throat> stay home and isolate, you have COVID. You know, all the signs point to it, you're presumed positive <clears throat> and they don't make me take a test. Well, the reporting mechanisms really are dependent upon a positive test that's given and presumed positives, no tests are given. And so it's really a, a product of how it's reported. Um, and so presumed positives aren't shown. And so when I talk, tell you today that we have three students with COVID who are in isolation, I also know because we do track, uh, we have it's two students that are presumed positive right now. So it's a total of five really. Uh, for staff, the last time we had a staff member uh, with a positive case was February 17th. I hope that continues. Um, you know, they're, they're doing really well. And I think part of that might be because our district and our staff were aggressive with getting the vaccine right from the start. And uh, we've had a lot of success in securing appointments for everybody that wanted one, and most of them wanted one. Uh, we do have five staff members on quarantine. A couple of them are associated with these student, student cases. And so there's staff members who also have children here who have COVID. And so now they have to quarantine. And so they're, they're associated, they're related. Uh, and so that's important to note. Well, in all, you know, we have three, like I said, three total cases that are reportable cases of over 4,000 people. And so we're doing well, and we have been for a while, and we need to continue to, to keep in that direction. And so the three cases we have are all students, one at the primary, and two at the academy. We've had almost 200 total COVID cases this school year, and we've had about 700 quarantines. Uh, out of curiosity, we were looking at... Um, people who were quarantined because of a possible school exposure and did they end up developing COVID? And what I can tell you is very rarely, uh, maybe less than two, one or 2% of those cases uh, had actually occurred. And so we can really only think of three instances of all of our, our quarantines and, co and uh, isolations where there may have been uh, school spread. And so, uh, you know, certainly we've been precautious and we've, we've, demonstrated caution and, and care in um, contact tracing and working with the Department of Health and trying to make smart decisions. Uh, but it's interesting to watch that data and see what it's telling us. And uh, what it's telling us is by and large, school is a safe place to be. That doesn't take away though, the fact that we need to make sure we're doing all the preventative measures. What I'll talk about a bit tonight and I'll say it uh, later on, but I'll say it now is the mask is the piece of data scientifically that's continues to be proven to make a difference. Um, there is a lot of dispute right now around the distancing, the six feet versus three feet, and I'll talk about that shortly, but the masks 
We're still masking, even if you have a vaccine or even if you had COVID within the last 90 days uh, in school, in this public space, uh, any school sanctioned events, masking and appropriate masking is important over the nose, over the mouth and the proper type of mask. Um, and so what do we need to fully reopen? We either need CDC or preferably New York State Department of Health guidance and have that guidance supported by our local Department of Health. Specifically, and you've heard me talk about this, if you've watched board meetings or read the, the, the communications on Fridays, the biggest challenge in a school our size and even smaller than us is that six foot social distancing rule. And uh, so that needed to be relaxed. What I can tell you is um, there was some research done and released about two weeks ago now in Massachusetts where they looked at school transmission rates amongst schools that were practicing six feet of social distancing and schools that were practicing three feet of social distancing. And what the scientists were able to determine is there was no discernible difference in, in uh, COVID rates. That it didn't matter, three feet or six feet, they both gleaned the same results and the same amount of infection. And so uh, what they could uh, assume at that point was, is that three feet is just as safe as six feet. Now that was one study about Massachusetts. If you search this topic, you'll find a lot of states across the United States and a lot of countries across the globe actually practice uh, three feet or one meter. Uh, in other countries, they're practicing one meter, which is about three feet, three inches. And um, again, it's a common practice that's been proven to work. And so therefore, uh, it got a lot of attention, the, the research that was done in Massachusetts that caused a number of entities to say, do we need to reevaluate this six feet concept? Um, and so where are we now? What are we hearing? Dr. Fauci represents the CDC and the, the federal government. And about a week and a half ago on a weekend, he in a conference said he anticipated new CDC guidance and that's the federal guidance would be changing soon. It was imminent that, um, that they recognize six feet and three feet might be the shift that needs to happen plus some other things. And lo and behold, uh, by that following Friday, CDC just this past Friday, put new guidance out moving from six feet to three feet. Dr. Zucker, uh, he represents our New York State Department of Health and he's from the governor's office. And he usually is in on all the governor's press conferences that he has multiple times per week. Uh, he was cited recently as saying that new guidance from uh, New York State Department of Health, NYSDOH, is imminent and coming soon. He was pressed on that issue and he reluctantly said um, within a week, maybe a week, as early as a week, we'd have that guidance. Uh, unfortunately, that was four weeks ago. And so if you're following media outlets, you'll see they're, they're, they're applying a lot of pressure on Dr. Zucker and on Governor Cuomo saying this, you know, you were saying new guidance was coming maybe as soon as a week and that was four weeks ago, what is happening? Uh, and so um, we have no gui new guidance from the New York State Department of Health. Uh, Dr. Mendoza, he, he's probably who you hear a lot when you watch the Rochester news stations. Uh, he's in, in charge of uh, the Department of Health in Monroe County. Um, you know, really has been a, a, a great resource for school superintendents and school leaders. Uh, I've had the honor of uh, Zooming with him and interacting with him a few times, uh, but Monroe County uh, school superintendents interact with him regularly. And, um, and I, you know, of course, I have some connections there, and they, they've been able to send me some of the documents that he's helped and created and, and um, for schools. And what he, his, his line of thinking, uh, what he is trying to do, uh, I think would be very helpful. And just last Friday, he and Adam Bello, the uh, county administrator from Monroe County, both uh, penned a letter uh, to Dr. Zucker and Governor Cuomo, pleading with them to fully and immediately adopt the guidelines of CDC. Uh, and so again, uh, Governor Cuomo and uh, Dr. Zucker haven't done that yet, uh, but it was, a, it was a, um, a poignant letter saying, please adopt it now. And you'll see our local elected officials, I think about Senator Helming, um, Assemblyman Gallahan, uh, they have both uh, been advocating for a revisit of these regulations. And uh, let's see if six feet really needs to be, or can we move it to three? And can we reconsider some of the other uh, guidelines for, that school districts are being forced to follow? Uh, and then, of course, I have ongoing weekly conversations with our Ontario County Public Health, OCPH, uh, with Mary Beer, um, you know, and, and that's been helpful. And, and we have a new county administrator who's been here for a little bit, and he's been great. And so we, you know, we Zoom um, at least once, if not twice a week, trying to work together 
Uh, they are very supportive of our efforts as a region to reopen schools, but they're awaiting New York State Department of Health. And the frustrating thing is this was posted uh, last week and this is from the New York State Department of Health website and it's specific to the six feet and the three feet piece. And you can see this last sentence where it says, determinations of the purview of the county health departments. And so what the New York State Department of Health is insinuating is that the local health department, Ontario County for us, could say move to three feet. But the reality is um, based on what I know and the interactions I've had across the state, when the local departments of health have tried to make changes, it isn't viewed favorably by the governor's office or the, the New York State Department of Health. And there are repercussions for that. And so there's this whole hesitancy um, and inconsistency happening around the state because of mixed messages that people are receiving from um, not, well, maybe the CDC, but certainly um, a lack of uh, communication from the New York State Department of Health is, is really causing people to struggle locally. I, I can't reiterate enough, our local folks have been nothing short of fantastic. They're supportive, they wanna help us, but they're, they, they don't believe they have the authority. Um, and, uh, and we're just kind of in a holding pattern a little bit right now, but I'll talk more about that in a minute. Here's what the CDC said, and I'm not gonna read this. And in fact, the document that was released Friday is about 31 pages, not about, it's 31 pages. Um, and here is some of the information in here, in, in the document that's really pertinent and most relevant to this conversation. In the elementary schools, so for us primary elementary schools, what that's referring to, we can be at three feet apart in the classrooms wearing, while everyone wears masks. It also says teachers need to be six feet away from, or, or adults in the room need to be six feet away from the students. This is the CDC guidance, adults six feet away, students three feet away. Uh, even where transmission in the community is low, moderate, or high. Doesn't matter what the transmission rate is, CDC endorses us working at three feet. For the middle and high school, they still support same things. Uh, three feet for students, six feet for adults, but only where the transmission rates are low, moderate, or substantial. So the way it goes, the, the, um, it, it, they rate it by low, moderate, substantial, or high. Those are the four ratings according to CDC. And currently in Ontario County, according to CDC, our school district would be considered substantial uh, transmission rates. So not the high level. Uh, and so by substantial, we could be at three feet. Um, and hopefully we're trending more towards the moderate to low. Uh, that's where we prefer to be. But as soon as you get to the high transmission rate in your community, middle and high school students need to shift to six feet according to the CDC. And it also talks about cohorting and stuff like that. And I'll talk about that in a minute as well. So in the CDC document, they mentioned mitigating strategies. Uh, and interestingly enough, in some of the communications that Dr. Mendoza has shared uh, with school leaders, he's mentioned mitigating um, strategies. And so he, he, and he's been talking about that prior to the CDC release. And so it makes me feel like um, because the way he referenced it is a little bit different than CDC. And, and I've checked my thinking with uh, representatives from Monroe County. Uh, and I've even checked my thinking with our county leadership and our legal firm. Uh, you know, I want to make sure I'm understanding it because a lot of times it's hard to get clarity and, and to ask questions and, and to have questions answered so we know we're interpreting things right. Um, but here's, here's what we're, we're knowing through CDC. Uh, barriers are no longer recommended. And so you might remember back uh, in the early winter, I put a survey out and I suggested, would people want us to try to bring kids back fully with masks and a barrier, a desktop barrier like this? Um, because that was allowed, and this bill is allowed by New York State Department of Health, masks and a desktop barrier. Uh, and the feedback was lukewarm on that. And so we, you know, we indicated we'll go in a different direction, but I believe it was lukewarm because science is showing that desktop barriers really do nothing. Uh, that COVID is spread through aerosols. They're spread in the air. Uh, and a barrier, if I'm sitting at a barrier and I'm breathing, the air I breathe goes up around and over and under and to the side of the barrier. It doesn't really prevent it. Places where maybe a barrier might be okay would be for you know some of our therapists, our speech therapists, for example, who maybe work closely with students and watching mouth uh, is an important part of the practice. And so they're really leaning in and close, but barriers in between them. And if you follow me on social media, you might've um, watched that back in the fall, I actually um, uh, pressed Dr. Mendoza around the concept of a face mask 
and a shield, a face shield, wearing both simultaneously. And my premise was that the mask was the mask, which were required and the shield would be the barrier, which I think would be much more effective than those desktop barriers. Um, and, and at that time he indicated that no, that wouldn't meet the letter of the law and the guidance. Um, but we're seeing some other counties now talk about that. On Oneida County, I think, is mentioning the mask and the shield. Uh, Onondaga County is mentioning the mask and the barriers, and they've ordered literally millions of dollars of barriers. Uh, and so anyway, CDC said barriers do nothing. The science has proved it. And so those are out as a recommendation. Uh, increased ventilation systems. And we have done this all along. Uh, we, you know, we're very fortunate that one of our board members, uh, this is an area of expertise for her. And uh, Dr. Jen Schneider, uh, she's really, um, she's, she focuses on um, hazmat situations, on um, all, all of this. And so this is, this is an area of expertise and we leverage that with her all the time. And so she's really helped guide us based on a lot of the research that her department's doing and that her system's working on uh, to make sure we're, um, we're positioning our facilities in the best spot as possible to be safe for everyone. Opening windows, um, you know, I've had my window open all year long uh, and I know a lot of our staff have as well. And even in the winter, uh, because having that fresh air circulate in is important uh, and having the airflow is important to, um, like I said, COVID is passed in the air and in the aerosols. And so to be able to, um, uh, to decrease the density of, of, of the, the air that people are breathing out in the classroom and have windows open is important. Air purification systems, we do have some. Again, this was kind of led by Dr. Jen again. Uh, this is some things that the, her, her labs have run a lot of tests around and have proven effectiveness. And so we have some running throughout the district already, and we're prepared to order more if we do fully reopen uh, to have put in larger spaces like cafeterias and things like that. The whole notion of cohorting and potting, I've mentioned once already, but I want to talk a little bit more detail with that. But essentially, it's um, when students can't be uh, spaced properly or we, they can't follow the rules properly that, um, you know, they be assigned to the same groups so that when and if there's any kind of exposure, that cohort or that pod is the only one exposed and therefore the only ones that would need to quarantine. I'll talk a bit about that um, in a future slide a little bit more. Uh, like I said, masking continues at this point and uh, no end in sight at this point, but it will have to end eventually. But right now masking is still in place. Distancing, whether that's three feet or six feet, um, we're still working through that. Uh, hand washing, of course, promoting constant hand washing, cleaning and disinfecting. And then our health screening that uh, everyone does every morning with the uh, brace square and contact tracing that we assist the county with. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about cleaning and disinfecting. Right now we we're doing it pretty constantly everywhere. Um, and in, in rooms where they have to have uh, individual use of, of supplies, we're cleaning between individual use. Interesting thing in the CDC document is they're not saying individual cleaning between individual use anymore. They're saying cleaning between cohort or groups or classes. And so if I'm an art teacher, you know, I don't, I wouldn't disinfect the equipment until the next class comes in and uh, the kids within that same class can share equipment without having to disinfect between individual use. Because think of it right now, what we're doing right now, and we're not changing it at this point. This is just what CDC is uh, recommending. Uh, but right now what happens is if, if a student was to use a, a paintbrush before another student could use that same paintbrush, the teacher has to disinfect it and then uh, give it to the next student. And so that is time consuming. It changes the way people teach and it changes how much content you can get through because you have to plan for all of that in a, in a variety of classes. Uh, and so that takes care of that screen. But our goal all along has been um, to be back full in person five days a week has been all along. And I'll talk about that in a minute, whether it's virtual uh, and synchronous or in person. Uh, but we need those guidelines to change. And uh, right now it would appear as though we need those guidelines to change with the New York State Department of Health. Uh, we could revisit that topic um, I will acknowledge that schools in Monroe County are doing exactly what we're doing. We're announcing our plans and we're preparing, uh, but we need New York State Department of Health to, uh, to help out here and to change some guidelines. There was an article in the Democrat and Chronicle uh, where uh, Superintendent Groutman from Greece, who's the president of the Monroe County Group, referenced just that. And if you read it carefully, you'll see that they said, everyone's preparing for a full reopening, but 
we can't reopen unless the New York State Department of Health changes the rules. I would anticipate maybe some schools will go rogue a little bit and say we're opening uh, and, and uh, certainly we'll be watching and trying to learn from them and see how it goes if that does indeed happen. Uh, but that's something to pay close attention to and I do. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty close with a lot of superintendents in Monroe County. Their districts are more our size. And so we communicate daily uh, about the progress, about the planning, we share ideas um, and we try to learn from one another. So there will be a, um, a, a survey going out and it'll go through Brave Square and essentially, uh, and it'll go out tomorrow morning and we'll ask you to submit at the latest by Monday of next week, Monday over break, and that's purposeful. We would like to get a really good sense of what people are selecting. So principals have that and, and directors have that in their hand over break to take a look at, to kind of get a sense of the, the scope of the work that's ahead of them and the, you know, the, the levity of the work. Because if, if a lot of people are changing, it's gonna make it a lot more difficult. Um, and so we, we really have to have an idea of what's, what's ahead of us so we can prepare properly. But you would, you would select um, that you want your child to do synchronous virtually for the rest of the school year if we go back to five days or in person five days a week if we go back to five days. And so the, your selection wouldn't change anything until a shift were to happen where we went back for five full, full days per week with everybody. Um, and so anyway, I'm gonna talk more about that in a minute. I wanna reference this diagram um, and I hope it doesn't look any different to you because we actually use this through the late summer and fall continuously. Uh, it hasn't changed. Nothing is different on it other than the circled part that you see right now. Um, initially, we asked people to select virtual learning or in-person learning. That's what we said. You, weren't, you didn't select hybrid, you actually selected in-person. And so um, when people select virtual, when they selected virtual learning, they selected synchronous learning on Mondays and Tuesdays and Thursdays and Fridays and asynchronous on Wednesdays. If we reopen five days a week, the synchronous learning will be Monday through Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, it'll be all five days. There wouldn't be an asynchronous day. Uh, but then over on the other side, if you had selected back in, in August, uh, preference two, it was in-person learning. And if you remember, I talked about this arrow here on the side saying, this is a continuum. What you're looking at is a continuum. Based on the guidelines that we have to work with by the state of New York, New York State Department of Health and our governor, we were forced into a hybrid, the middle section that's highlighted. But I said repeatedly that if guidelines changed or infection rates changed, if you select in-person, this could go up or down. It could shift to full in-person five days a week, or it could shift to completely remote if infection rates or quarantines or you know, things got worse and the government came in and shut us down. And I talked about how this remote, if it was shifted here, would look a little different than this because people were signed up for different things and their capacity was different. And so maybe this is hopefully bringing this back to you. So um, anyway, we're here, we're at hybrid. We have an inkling that some of the restrictions and guidelines might start loosening where we can have real serious conversations about bringing back students five days a week, uh, Monday through Friday. And so it would be here. So the survey is going to go out tomorrow morning around 10 a.m. And there'll be three different surveys. There'll be one for students, one for staff, and one for parents. For students, I'll say this actually, for students, staff, and parents, all three, we're gonna ask this top column here, this top row here, we'll ask for a temperature check. Really essentially what we're asking is, how are things going for you currently? And you could answer, you know, things are going, things are going well for me currently in the current setup. Or you could answer, things are not going well currently in the current setup. It's just a temperature check. How are things going? Um, as I said here, that this was always a continuum. This was our learning models and we were willing and ready to shift and move about when guidelines changed. When I presented at the board meeting last night, the feedback I received from some folks was, you know, why, didn't, why aren't we asking people do we wanna shift up here to this? Well, this was the learning model from the beginning where it shifted up and down, but I do care what people think and I wanna know how things are going. And so this is a temperature check for everybody. And it'll give us a good sense of, you know, what percentage of people think it's going pretty well. Like right now we're in a rhythm, we're in a, uh, we're kind of we're moving along. Um, and which, what percentage of people think it's not going well. And that is from a parent perspective, a staff perspective and a student perspective. 
For students, we'll also ask them, what are your concerns if we open five days a week? We have a list of things and they can check all or any that apply. And then we have an area where they can type in. And then we'll ask them what supports might they need if we reopen five days a week. Again, we have a list of things and then they can type. Uh, there's an area for that as well. For staff, we're gonna do that same thing, the temperature check. We're gonna ask them if, if we're able to accommodate and you'd prefer a virtual assignment versus in-person, let us know and we'll try to accommodate. We have some virtual teachers now and we have in-person teachers now and we'll do our very best to accommodate based on the needs of the students. And then we're also asking vaccination status. And so uh, the governor did sign an executive order where we're supposed to submit our staff vaccination rates, uh, but he's given no mechanism to do so other than saying you have to report it to the local department of health. And our local department of health has, given, has, has been given no direction as to how to do this. Uh, and so we're trying to be proactive here and staff can say that they're fully vaccinated or that they've received their first dose of Pfizer or Moderna if they went that route or that they have an appointment but haven't received a, a vaccination shot yet or that they don't have an appointment and they're not interested or that they prefer not to answer. Uh, you know, certainly they can decline that, but um, we're just trying to be proactive and gather the information with a little bit of peace of mind. I would say we have about 730 staff and I'm very comfortable in saying that over 500 at least have it. And I'm also confident in saying, because it comes through my office, that any staff member who wants a, a vaccine, we've coordinated uh, appointments. And at this point, nobody else has been asking for any. And then for the parents, you'll, we'll do the temperature check and you will get a separate survey for every one of your children. So I have three children here. I'll have three separate surveys because it's different for each of my children. How's it going? Uh, what's, the, um, what's your instructional model selection? If you select in person, now we need to know about busing and transportation. And so do you need AM, PM, where to, what's the contact number, so forth and so on. And so we would ask you to answer that. And so really here we are is this week is more about education, learning, forums, surveys, ga gathering data. And the next two to three to four weeks will be preparation. Uh, we'll be preparing so that when and if the New York State Department of Health changes the rules, we can, we can reopen and, and move quicker. Uh, we, can, we can kind of turn and, and make that shift quicker than what we would otherwise. With the CDC releasing their information, I think we have a better sense of what New York State might do. Uh, they'd be more inclined to follow the CDC. And uh, as a side note, California just yesterday morning announced that they're following the three foot rule. And so I think that's positive news for New York State um, in a lot of ways because it might influence New York State a little bit to make that change. But we want to prepare so that we could be ready to open anytime between Monday, April 19th, and Monday, May 17th, through that time frame. And I've decided that if we can't open by May 17th, we will finish the year in the structure we're in now. May 17th, if we could open that week, we would have five weeks of in-person instruction. Anything less than that, this is a huge ask and a very big shift to happen with only you know, really four weeks to go because the next Monday would be, would give us only four weeks and within that time frame would be regents exams. And so we really would be getting very little out of the shift and they'd be causing a pretty significant disruption. I really would like to have us back in person for a bit this year. It will prepare us for September and uh, I'd be hopeful that we can make that happen. The other piece to note is April 19th that week is New York State ELA assessments. And so that's a little bit of a challenging week to bring people back. Uh, we have it on here still, it's aspirational, but um, we may run into issues with the three through eight New York State assessments. And we just have to kind of follow that closely and, uh, and see how that kind of fleshes out. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute too. Uh, but that would be our goal to open sometime in that time frame, and to be ready to. We're trying to anticipate, gather information and prepare. April 19th is also the beginning of our fourth quarter. And so in your mind, you might say, oh, that's great because that gives us 10 full weeks of instruction. It does, but also let's keep in mind, there'll be a lot of reacclimation, onboarding, community building, and social emotional support for everyone, students, staff alike. We have not been together like this in over a year, and there'll be a lot of work to do to kind of bring us back together. And so, um, although we will be focusing on instruction, we will simultaneously be focusing on being there for one another, uh, providing that SEL support, and building community, because that is the foundation of what we do.
And so what will it look like? If you choose to be back in person, what will the day look like? And hopefully I can give a little bit of a snapshot into this. Classrooms, this picture you see, there's six feet distance between the students. And the six foot is measured middle of chair or middle of desk to middle of chair or middle of desk. In essence, where the middle of the student is. Uh, three, it would be moved to three feet. We would move all of it to three feet and the students, uh, our intent is to make it so all students are forward facing at three feet. We have ordered, we have on order a number of desks right now, hundreds of desks, because as you might know, and if you're in education, you know there was a big movement to move away from individual desks into tables. They're more collaborative, they generate more discussion. And so what we're doing is we're ordering desks that kind of look like these, that are actually made to uh, push together and be tables as well. And so when this is all over, they can convert back to tables and, uh, and we have a lot of old desks anyway. So, uh, you know, it's kind of a win-win and we'll be able to use it long beyond uh, pandemic and COVID. And so it'll be three feet in classrooms. Teachers will be six feet away. And so the instructional space for the teacher will be at the front of the room or the perimeter of the room. Certainly they can go close to students and help and offer support and they can circulate. But once they've done that, moving back to the teaching and instructional space is important. Now, I'll share a story. We had an incident where we might've had a classroom exposure to COVID this year. And through the investigation, we learned that everyone was really good at mask wearing. Everybody was six feet away. The staff in the room stayed in the instructional space. And when they did go to assist students, they assisted students and then they moved back to their instructional space. And it resulted in no quarantines and it resulted in nobody contracting COVID. They followed the, the guidelines perfectly. And our staff have, and students have done that consistently throughout the year. I'm so proud of, of, of their persistence and, and their self-discipline um, around that. In the cafeteria, we're really working hard on a plan to have all um, students eat six feet apart like they are now. But there has been reference in Dr. Mendoza's communications and in the CDC document that perhaps kids could eat at tables in pods or cohorts. And so they would have assigned seats or pods of you know, six, eight kids. And if there was an exposure within that pod or that group, that it would only impact that group. And that would be the group that would have to quarantine. Now, we will not institute that type of an approach unless we're certain that it's by the letter of the law and that the New York State Department of Health and our public health support, supports that approach. And so we have that kind of as an option. But in the meantime, we're looking at um, other ways and creative spaces to do six feet for, for lunches. Uh, it will not be easy. And uh, we may need, may need to hire uh, monitors to monitor these lunchrooms because the more spaces you have, the more monitors you'll need. Uh, but it is something our principals and directors are working incredibly hard on trying to figure out how to make this happen to get us through this year if need be. Uh, busing. Busing in the CDC document is exactly what we're following now. It's uh, six feet or one per seat where possible. The only thing that's different is uh, we are, we're not doing it where possible. We're doing it. Uh, it's one per seat or six feet. And here's the caveat to that. If you're a same household family, you can sit together. So um, if you have siblings, they can sit together. They're in the house together all day long anyway. Uh, and so that's kind of what CDC is, is suggesting. We looked at our runs. We have 59 runs, 45 of our runs we would be perfectly fine following the same protocol we are right now if the same number of parents continue to transport. Now we know that some parents were willing to transport two days a week, five days a week is a bigger ask. And so uh, we'll have to evaluate that and take a close look at it. And so where possible right now, we know we have 14 runs that might have um, students double up in a couple in some of the seats. Um, but other than that, we will be um, by and large following what we always have as long as people uh, can still transport their kids. This missile at the PES, uh, that's a challenging one. We, you know, with more parents driving, that means more people being picked up. We're working on a couple concepts where we might be able to dismiss normal, uh, like we have been all year long, and maybe there won't be a disruption. We're just going to change patterns and things like that. Uh, but worst case scenario, we might look at a dual dismissal or a, um, a staggered dismissal, I should say, not a dual. In other words, um, you know, one week one group gets a standard dismissal time and the other one's a little bit later and we pay staff to stay after and help um, uh, supervise and coordinate the dismissal process. We're hoping to avoid that, but that is our fallback plan. Uh, the principals made some good ground today on a concept that might, might be able to work without having to stagger anything. 
And so uh, we think we'll be okay. And at the secondary levels, um, I don't anticipate a major problem there. Uh, it's been incredibly light <laughs> compared to normal years. Um, if you're new to driving, it might seem busy for you, but I'll tell you as a veteran uh, driver of kids to school, it's incredibly light. And so even if we doubled that, what we have now, uh, it will, it's still much lighter than what it typically is. Um, shared equipment, we are looking at the concept of disinfecting between classes and groups, not individual use. We're not making that change now. We're still following and monitoring what New York State Department of Health does, but it's something we're looking at doing. For physical education, band and chorus, uh, they're right now having to be at 12 feet and wear masks. Uh, CDC says six feet in masks, and that would be a huge help. We've been advocating for that change for months. And actually we made ground on it with band and chorus where we're doing that with extracurricular activities like marching band and in the sound our, our pep band and things like that. Um, and we were trying and we have support to transition to that for the fourth quarter uh, if it's successful, but the CDC says it's, it's, it's safe and many other states and even New York state does it for the college level. So uh, we do see moving this to six feet um, will be very reasonable and likely. But again, we're not doing any of these things until we can have assurance from our local Department of Health and our State Department of Health that we're not violating anything. Uh, and so, you know, we're watching closely and we're preparing. Uh, it's important to know that when we look at the survey results, we're gonna evaluate student placement based on what you've asked for. If you're changing your, um, your instructional delivery model at the primary elementary school, it will most likely lead to a teacher change. So if you've been a virtual student, you wanna come back, it will most likely be a teacher change. Um, not 100% not guaranteed, but most likely. Uh, at the academy in the middle school, same thing. If you're changing models, you'll most likely change some teachers in some of your classes. And it's important to know, um, you may not be able to take some classes if you switch to virtual. Uh, and, and our families who have virtual students knew this back in the fall when they uh, selected virtual and they saw their schedules, we can't offer everything virtually. And so uh, there'll be some things you'll have to look at and evaluate uh, to make your decisions. Uh, but again, this is something we'll, we'll kind of evaluate as numbers come in. What I can tell you is other schools that have done the survey in Monroe County already, that high 90% of people just stay with their current model. So if I'm virtual, I just finish the year out virtual. If I'm in person, hybrid, I just stay in person and now it's five days a week. Uh, and literally like 97 to 98% are staying with the same uh, delivery model that they selected. And, and that's helpful. I'm going to just be upfront about it. That'll be helpful with our ability to pull this off. Uh, social emotional health. We have great uh, social workers, counselors, psychologists, prevention specialists, other support staff there for the kids. And we know that that is the foundational piece that we have to be focused on first, being there to help kids. We have to reacclimate kids. I think about the primary level our kindergarten students, some of them have never been to school five days a week. And so, you know, we really have to teach them, how do you school? How, how do you school again? Uh, and it's not just kindergartners, it's all, all of our kids. It's not quite like riding a bike. Uh, there'll, be, there'll be a time frame where we're going to have to kind of go through routines and, and build stamina. Uh, everyone will be incredibly exhausted uh, with this new kind of approach uh, back to full time if that's the way we go. Uh, Matt, do you want to talk a bit about state assessments and any updates that might be there? Uh, thanks, Jamie. Uh, in terms of state assessments, uh, the information that continues to come from state ed uh, seems to be pretty fluid, but in, the, in recent days, we've received some more definitive answers about what we can expect. Uh, you may know that the New York State applied for a waiver, waiver from the federal government in relationship to federally mandated assessments, uh, hoping to not uh, have to administer those for students this year. Um, at this point, the feedback we've been given from the federal government is they have not responded officially to the waiver that's been submitted. Um, in the event that they do not respond or they do not approve that waiver, um, all schools are expected to administer grades three through eight testing in mathematics and ELA. And Jamie referenced the time frame for at least the ELA exams to be the week of uh, April 19th, but the math exams to take place later in May. Uh, in addition, uh, what the state has also recently announced that they will uh, they will postpone or remove the requirement for regents exams uh, for a few of them, but there still are a few regents exams we are required to give uh, just per the federal mandate uh, for reporting attached to four exams in particular. Those are algebra, uh, ELA, um, 
living environment and earth science. So for those four exams themselves, uh, those are the four exams at this point for regents exams that we're uh, expected to give, uh, but we continue to wait for updates and information. And so uh, the buildings and our staff are preparing in anticipation for having to administer those. Uh, for the three aid assessments, there have been some adjustments to them. For example, uh, they've informed us that they've removed field test questions, and they've also reduced the requirement for each of the exams for math and ELA to be a two-day exam down to a one-day exam. Uh, and so uh, we are preparing and adjusting our plans accordingly uh, to be able to meet uh, the expectations that the state has, has currently laid out for us. Thanks, Matt, I appreciate it. Um, getting word that my microphone is a bit muffled and I apologize for that, I'm not sure why that is. I think the earlier one went fine, uh, but it sounds like it's good enough where people can at least hear what I'm saying. Um, appreciate the insight on the assessments, Matt. Traditions, people have been asking about what's happening with commencement and our senior ball and junior prom. And what I can tell you is for commencement, we continue to plan and prepare. Uh, we're looking at CMAC, our traditional commencement. We're looking at Bristol Mountain again. And uh, we've been in communications with both of those entities and they're certainly willing and happy to help us. And so we'll be talking to the students and, and families and see what they prefer uh, based on what our guidelines are that we have to work within. The senior ball, junior prom, uh, we brought this question to our local department of health uh, several times and they brought it to the control room, which really kind of uh, is the, is the uh, conduit to the governor's office to try to get uh, answers and, and guidelines around that. And still we haven't really received any, any uh, clear guidelines on that. So we'll continue to ask the question and try to plan, but we certainly would like to do something for our students uh, in that regard. Uh, in any changes to athletics and the regulations, I know one of the questions popped up early and I answered it a little bit ago, but I'll answer it again. Uh, the only, there's been no changes. Uh, as you know, the, you know, sports are up and running and there's controls that we have to put in place and a major kudos to our athletes, our parents, our coaches, our, our athletic director, Jim Simmons, um, because, you know, they have been so successful in, um, in, in support, uh, playing safely. Uh, they've done just a great job and, and I'm really proud of them. And, and, and that's great. The one restriction that is uh, hot on people's mind is the uh, fans. What can we do with fans? Uh, right now, the New York State um, Public Health, uh, High School Athletic Association in conjunction with different sections uh, are permitting two spectators per athlete. And this has been going on from the fall. You know, I have children that participate in sports and um, back in the fall and all seasons and, and the same thing is two spectators per athlete uh, is all that's permitted right now. And so if people are looking to advocate for that, it really would be with the governor's office, with the New York State Public High School Athletic Association uh, and with section five, we have no local uh, decision in that matter. Um, and, but also kudos to our tech team. Uh, we have a fantastic IT team and we've pretty much succeeded in, in uh, streaming events live and we're getting better and better at it all the time. And so uh, at least if we can't be there in person, we can be there uh, virtually and watch live on our YouTube channel. I know I've enjoyed uh, working at home in my home office and I usually have my iPad next to my computer and I'm streaming any number of events that are happening. And so, although a lot of you know that I'm at a ton of events in normal times, I'm you know, almost every night at something, um, I feel like I'm even at more now uh, in a weird sort of way, even though I prefer to be there in person. Uh, and so nothing really seems to be changing with athletics at this point. Although uh, I should mention this, uh, I think it was on Friday, Governor Cuomo announced that they were allowing uh, interstate travel for athletic competitions. Uh, up until this point, we were only allowed to uh, travel regionally and compete. So within section five, for example, now they're allowing you to travel outside of your section to compete. Uh, not that that's really gonna have an impact, I don't believe right now, uh, but that could have an impact in the fall. Uh, what else is happening? So actually we're gearing up. Spring break is next week, but we have a lot of students in grades six through 12 that'll be here learning. And so students have signed up to come to school Monday through Thursday and work on uh, completing work that they've struggled to complete or filling some learning gaps that they've developed. Uh, and we have teachers that'll be here. We have support staff. We have uh, student mentor volunteers. I think we have 78 students who volunteered to be here to help. Uh, their peers, and which is just fantastic. And so uh, that's up and getting ready to run next week. So we're excited about that. 
We're working on expanding our intervention services and maybe having some in-person intervention services on Wednesdays and after school on days that students aren't actually here typically. And so they would come in uh, on days that they aren't here. So please stay tuned for that if your student receives intervention services. And we are discussing to expand it to, to other students with tutoring services. Uh, but, you know, this next kind of leads into that. We're uh, looking to build out our summer school offerings. So they're offered and available to almost everybody. Uh, typically in the past, you had to qualify for summer school programming. But the federal government is uh, funneling money towards school districts for gap recovery. Uh, and part of that is, is one-time money. And so can we build summer school programming that's different, that's uh, totally out of the box? And for example, could we do it in a manner that's uh, themed? And so maybe one week is focused on robotics, mathematics, and science. And we have our robotics team here and we have our math teachers here and we really hone in and focus on that. Maybe there's a poetry week focused on literacy and language arts. And, and we just have these themes that people can sign up for and take part in. And it's beyond ju you know, just the typical summer school that you have to qualify for. It's, it's, it's built out much beyond that. And so our team is working hard on, um, on developing that and, and, uh, and more information to come. But you know, we're excited about what this could be. And my uh, challenge to them was, I know this is one-time monies and we might only be able to do it for a year or two, but if we can make it so fantastic, make it, make it so fantastic that it's a really hard decision to not continue some way, shape, or form. Uh, and so they, they took to that challenge well, and I know they're, they're, they're working and excited about some of the things that they're working on. And then the other piece is before and after school programming for next year. A lot of other schools have before and after school program. Typically, the way it happens in New York State is when schools uh, struggle with their performance results, the state comes in and they do evaluations, they end up uh, funneling money their way and grants come their way to develop um, a way to extend the school day. So there's before and after school programming. Well, one of the nice things about Canada Egua is we, we achieve pretty highly here on a consistent basis. So we historically haven't qualified for grants or money from the state for before and after school programming, but the federal government appears to be providing it for everybody right now. And so what we'll do is visit some of those schools that have had success with before and after school programming and learn how they're doing it and mimic what we can here and then personalize it for what's needed here in Canandaigua. And so we're working on that for next year for students and families that would be interested. But again, the survey is coming tomorrow and essentially you'll, you'll, you'll select uh, fully in-person five days per week of instruction or fully virtual five days per week if we make that shift. And there'll also be transportation questions as well. And we ask that you complete that by Monday of next week at 9 a.m. That will give our principals and directors time to really kind of digest it before their, their staff return on that following Monday so they can start working. Uh, I just want to thank everybody. Um, this is, when we went into education, this is not what we were signing up for. Uh, this is not what we had hoped for at all by any stretch of the imagination. And we hope, we'd, we hope that someday uh, in the not too far future, we can reflect back and, and it's hard to remember what was it like to be an educator during a pandemic and during COVID. We hope that this can be a distant memory at some point in time, um, but we know that's probably not going to be the case. We know that things will change because of what we've been through. Some for the better and some, some for the worse, uh, but it's our challenge to kind of recover those changes from the worse and improve upon it. And it's our challenge to find what made us better during this COVID and during this pandemic and carry it forward and become better because of it. And so our students, our staff, our community, our parents, I know this has been a challenging time, but I'm continually touched by your grace, by your support and, and by everything you do, putting the focus on our students and trying to do what's best for kids. And so I thank you for that. Uh, without further ado, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen uh, that way, Matt and I can now kind of bounce back and forth with questions. I know at the peak, we were well over uh, a couple hundred people, which was great. Um, and so I think we've answered the first two questions now. Um, I haven't had a chance to read the third question about kindergarten and pre-K classes. Have you, Matt? Yeah, so the, the, the first question we're, we'll cover is uh, thinking about um, our younger learners and really thinking about uh, if we're looking at pre-K and even kindergarten in general, thinking about the amount of time it might take uh, to get them acclimated, uh, but also thinking about minimizing any kind of change, whether it's their schedule, their teachers, or with their peers. Um, I, I can certainly respond to this question, which we wholeheartedly agree. 
Uh, in fact, whether it's the UPK level all the way up to you know our seniors, we want to try to have as little impact as possible uh, on our students and our staff. And I think that's what makes this process so incredibly complex is you know, we could just arbitrarily throw everybody back into the mix and just say, hey, we're open, let's see how this goes. But I know our teachers uh, and our, our administrative team are really wanting to make sure that there's consistency for our students and themselves. And so to help minimize the, the impact or any level of significant change to students is certainly gonna be our goal. Um, but we also stressed earlier today in our forum that as students come back into our buildings, we also really need to prioritize that acclimation process that Jamie talked about. Um, you know, we have to be thoughtful about not just jumping right into academics when we know we have, we, we are essentially going to, it's going to feel like starting school in September in March. And some of those same things, all the way, they occurred from a cohort basis all the way back in September. As students return to the classroom, we have to get them acclimated to a whole other group of students and trying to understand how the classroom functions uh, five days a week versus two days a week. There's going to be a lot of carryover from that, uh, but we do need to spend some time uh, from our youngest year learners all the way up, uh, really thinking about that that process thoughtfully. Thanks, Matt. I've got the next two. They kind of go hand in hand if you can get the one after that uh, from Rachel. But the first one I'm going to answer is the New York State guidelines are simply guidelines, not law. At this point, CDC guidelines can supersede state law and guidelines. In fact, that's not correct. If you um, attended our last forum, you'll see where um, people, New York, NYSED, the New York State Education Department, tried to interpret the New York State Department of Health guidelines guidelines and uh, were, was forced by the governor's office to retract their interpretation and said that schools must follow six feet in masking and there was no uncertain terms about it. Uh, I've actually even reached out to our attorneys and asked the question, can we just follow CDC guidelines? And right now our legal counsel is saying, no, you're, you're tied to and bound to the New York State Department of Health guidelines. Uh, and so I know it might feel like they're guidelines and just recommendations. There's also mechanisms in place where people can report us if we're not following these guidelines. And uh, when they report us, I have an automated message that comes to me from the regional representative to the governor, our sheriff, our county administrator, and our public health director copied into it. And so there are checks and balances to make sure we're following these guidelines, just like a restaurant, if they were violating the guidelines, could be shut down, so can the schools. And schools have been shut down around New York State for not following it previously. And so um, I know that's a common misunderstanding or misconception, but I'm here to tell you the rules we have to follow right now, whether we like it or not. And, and for those of you who have talked to me, you know I want us reopened and you know I've been advocating hard for a reopening and for a revisiting of these regulations. Um, it's, it's just something I believe in. The other piece about, um, it seems like the Monroe County schools are ahead of us and, and in the preparations and that maybe Canandaigua is stuck in analysis paralysis. Uh, again, I'll share with you, um, I'm very close with the superintendents at Webster, at HFL, um, and a variety of others, Hilton, uh, I could name a few of them. And I can tell you what we're doing in our planning and preparation is exactly in line with, their, with what they're doing. Uh, we compare our notes, we compare our presentations, we compare our plans, we steal ideas from each other, other's plans. We have been preparing for a while and we could be up and ready by the 19th, but again, um, the concern with that is, uh, well, we need to know from the survey how many people are switching. And even then, I believe we could do it, uh, but the concern is more around the New York State uh, ELA assessment three through eight. Uh, can we do it with also that? That's a lot in a week. Um, but anyway, uh, I, I apologize that, that your, um, your perception on it, uh, I know differently simply because I'm communicating with Monroe County superintendents constantly. The Victor superintendent, I'll throw him in there too. Uh, he and I talk all the time, uh, almost daily. Uh, so anyway, I, I know we're, we're at the same spot as most. So the next question is in relationship to uh, students possibly changing their preference. So if a student is enrolled in the virtual model currently and they select to return to five day in person, would they have the same teacher? Uh, and then is there the potential that someone who is a virtual t a student could they, um, would they have, would they um, lose the teacher if in fact the teacher doesn't want to teach virtually anymore? So it's kind of twofold. So the first question is, if you are switching from virtual to in-person, um, chances are they, they may have a different teacher. We can't guarantee that it'll be the same teacher. Um, and uh, that has a lot to do with the balancing the number of students and any kind of changes. Again, uh, as Jamie indicated, 
some of the surveys from area districts are indicating that there isn't a large amount of change of people selecting a different preference. So that would more than likely be minimized in terms of um, if, a t if a student stays within the model that they would t they more than likely would keep the same teacher, but any change is gonna result in a higher possibility of, of, of a change in uh, the teacher that they might have. Uh, the second part of the question has to do with would the students lose the teacher that they currently have if the teacher chooses not to engage in the virtual model any longer? Um, that's that's hard to say. Uh, I don't know that we are, you know, as part of our planning, we're really going to be thinking about where our teachers are at. And uh, we may have teachers indicate um, that they would like to switch from their current placement. However, um, it would only be if we were able to accommodate that shift. Uh, and so we, we've had to do some um, some things locally to ensure that we had the, enough teachers to support that virtual model. And so we're going to continue to use the same process that we had. But again, uh, the goal would be to minimize any kind of change so that te uh, students don't have new teachers as as, as little as possible. Uh, thanks, Ben. I think I have the next like two or three here. It, one of them just kind of goes right where you're saying. If you're staying in, in person, will my child have the same teachers? They currently have or will they be moved because students and kids in class uh, we hope to minimize any changes of teachers period uh, we can't really foresee an instance where if your child stays in person where um, you, you would change teachers but i can't 100 percent guarantee it there might be a small percent chance where that could happen um, we know we have some issues uh, at our secondary levels with class sizes particularly uh, if we added the gray and cherry cohort together that we have to really take a close look at. Uh, but beyond that, again, it should be very rare. We hope it doesn't happen and we're going to work to try to make it not happen, but it, it could. Um, and then the next question is, why are we giving people a choice to switch from virtual to in-person? It was made clear. Uh, thanks for remember that. It was made clear when uh, people made their selections that this is what you were choosing. And you know, the only thing I'll say to that is, as we've been talking about reopening, I've had a lot of family members reach out and say, you know, I'm comfortable with my kid going under the hybrid model, a couple days a week, six feet, uh, less dense. I'm comfortable with that. I don't think I'm comfortable with them going if everyone's back right now. And so, you know, that's, that's the challenge that I'm under right now is trying to make decisions, knowing that there's just no way I'm gonna please everybody. It's just gonna, it's impossible under the circumstance that it is. Um, what we're trying to, we're trying to accommodate people. We're trying to be a service organization. And then um, I'm going to answer the next one. And if you can read the one after that, Matt, that'd be helpful. Uh, someone's asking why are close contact sports with heavily breathing athletes mixing from different schools and states permit? Well, states, no, that's not permitted unless it's travel and outside of school. I just want to interject there permitted, but having students in a classroom not considered safe. That is the exact same question I can consistently ask. People actually criticized me for advocating for sports and the performing arts. Um, and I happily said, the reason I'm advocating for those is I think there's an opening. I think there's a door that we can actually get approval for. And if we can get approval for it and we can do it and we can do it safely, doesn't that support our argument that we can, we can teach in a classroom safely? And I'm happy to say so far, it's happened that way. We've had sports, contact sports, we've had wrestling safely. How can we not have teaching safely with masks? Um, I, I jokingly was talking with Mr. Kane. He's our uh, uh, curriculum area lead teacher for music. And he was having his first sound, our pep band rehearsal at six feet. They had been 12 feet up until that point. And he said, I'm nervous. And I said, why? And he said, because six feet is closer than 12. And I, you know, I didn't see it until we you know, were all in here. And I went in and I looked at the room and, and I just kind of laughed and I said, do me a favor, walk down. There's a wrestling tournament happening. Go check that out for a minute. And then if you think what you're about to do isn't safe, then you just let me know. And we laughed about it because honestly, it doesn't make sense. If they're able to do it safely, how come we can't teach in school safely? I think, it's, I think that's evidence that we bring to the governor's office and we continue to, to hound them with that. I, I shouldn't say the word hound, that's not professional or appropriate. But we continue to point that out. And the same thing uh, with, like I said, Senator Helming, Assemblyman Gallahan, they agree. They're advocating for this change too. And they keep pointing these things out as well. The next question, Jamie, is uh, will an aftercare program be available at the primary elementary school for in-person five day a week students? 
um, indicating that uh, the availability of that might be an impact on the decision. So, oh, well, so maybe I can answer that one a little bit. Uh, I have had conversations with the YMCA. You know, currently they're doing you know a school program, and, and if we reopen, they may not have a need for the school day program anymore, but they would have a need to ramp up the before and after school program that they've always run here at the uh, at the school. And we told them absolutely we would support them in doing that. And so the YMCA would be a before and after school program. Places like our children's place, they have this on their radar as well. I know they they're aware. Um, and so, but yes, the, the YMCA before and after school program is something that they're working on and uh, they would hope to have up and running if we make this shift. So the next question is in relationship to um, thinking about final exams in high school, will they be given without regions exams? Uh, and do we have an anticipated last instructional day for students? Uh, I can tell you this has been a conversation regionally with my colleagues that are other assistant superintendents for instruction. Uh, and things are very much mixed across the board. Um, you know, I think that uh, assessment in general is a very challenging topic in, in, in this time. Uh, we know assessment is a part of teaching and learning because it gives us an idea as to how our students are doing. And I know our teachers have been doing that in an ongoing fashion. Um, at present, we haven't had any further conversations about having local final exams in courses where regents exams would not be administered. Um, what I would say to you is right now, the current thinking is that we would be very thoughtful about the extent to which we are engaging in additional assessment, given just the range of experiences for our students this year. Uh, in the same way that the state is reflecting that regents exams, giving them the students um, in the places where we don't have to, um, is not a practice that they are supporting. In fact, they are the ones that have been advocating for us not to engage in that. Um, that's sort of the path and the guidance that, you know, that we believe makes a lot of sense in terms of thinking about how the end of the year it, um, uh, concludes for students. Um, really trying to emphasize time in class for just continued instruction as opposed to adding additional assessments or demands on, on our students. Thanks, I'll, I'll, oh, go ahead. The last instructional day piece. Uh, so just to really answer that, uh, June 16th at, at present is what the last instructional day would be at uh, the 9-12 level because that's when the Regents Week begins. And the first exam is given on June 17th. Uh, and then the remainder of the district would conclude uh, as, as it's currently scheduled. I believe June 24th is our last day. I could be mistaken, just pulling the calendar up. I think June 24th would be our last instructional day. And a lot of that has to do with uh, emergency days, how many we have left. And sometimes we do a, a couple half days or things like that. Those are determined a little bit later on. Thank you. Um, so I'll take the next two, Matt, if you want to take the third one about spring recess and you know, just, just scrolling down there. So sure. uh, one is what about classes eating at lunch in the classroom? And so that is something we're looking at. But remember, classrooms will be spaced at three feet. Um, you know, so at the primary elementary school, that is something that the administrators down there have considered, but they're really working hard to try to devise a mechanism so that people are eating at six feet. Uh, and so stay tuned on that, but um, in the classrooms are, are a possibility at primary elementary school and maybe even rotating some through the cafeteria because those kids haven't eaten in the cafeteria all year long at the primary elementary school. Outside, do we have, can we, um, can we commandeer a bunch of picnic tables and areas to eat outside so it's with the fresh air, things like that you know, are all things we're working on. Um, and then the next question is we need to consider the impact on our first, first graders and kindergartners who have yet to experience a full year of school. Uh, any thoughts on both grades and acclimation differently from the rest? And there has been a little talk around, do we acclimate different grades differently, bringing them back um, in a different fashion to help uh, build stamina, onboard them, reacclimate them. Uh, no solidified plans yet, but those are conversations that are ongoing. So it's, it's a great question. The next question has to do with spring re recess. What are the times for middle and high school and how many students are attending in each school? Uh, again, the process for that um, uh, has really been pretty collaborative with the teachers at the buildings uh, to make nominations for students who they feel like based on their current progress would really benefit from some additional support. So uh, it isn't something where uh, it's an all call and if you're interested, you can just come and show up. Um, we've had to be pretty strategic to try to balance the number of, of staff that are available with the number of students that we feel like uh, would benefit based on that progress that we have. So uh, the, if you haven't been contacted at this point, uh, chances are that uh, your student is, is doing fairly well. And uh, based on their current progress, 
they're not a student that was nominated by by a teacher for that additional support. Uh, but in general, it's a range of times. Uh, some students are coming for full days, some are coming for half days. Uh, and at present, uh, I don't have the exact number of students. That was one of the questions here, but I can tell you that uh, at the academy, for example, there are 292 um, courses that students are going to be attending. Now, a student might have within that two and three and four courses that maybe they're coming to uh, attend and engage in. So uh, on average, most students, it might be a range of one to three courses that they're coming for. So if we're to try to divide things out, I would say we're probably somewhere between 100 and 125 students at the academy. And at last check at the middle school, it was around 60 students uh, that will be coming uh, over the, the spring recess. Thanks, Matt. Um, I think we can get to the next few. Uh, if cohorts or pods happen for lunch, will parents be given the choice uh, with who their children are assigned to? Some parents will be comfortable because they've already created their own pods through um, their friends that they hang out with outside of school or they play sports with. And that's a great question. We've actually talked quite a bit about that. I think the way the pods would work if we did it is almost identical to how it happens at the middle school and the academy anyway, right now, is the students go in, they find a table with their friends, the people they hang out with, and we tell them on day one, once they're sitting there, that's where you're locked in. That's your assigned seat for the rest of the year now. Uh, that's your pod. Uh, at the primary elementary school, the pod would be consisted of their classroom, classmates, um, you know, for obvious reasons. And so they're Although there wouldn't be say necessarily, I think what you're asking, uh, I think the way it would work out would, would give you what you're asking. Um, the next one is really if a student switches from virtual, if you want to read the next one on there, or actually I, I have the next one too, <laughs> the next okay, one, if you're okay with it. Yeah, sure. Um, do you want to take the virtual one, the very next one? And then yep. I'll get to my, okay. Fair enough. So the next question is, uh, if a virtual student goes hybrid, or excuse me, goes in person at the academy or middle school, they'll have done work for most of the year or half of the class of one semester class and may not get credit for the class. Uh, I, I, I'm trying to understand the question, but I think what they're asking for is they're wondering about if there's a switch mid-year. So for example, uh, if a class, uh, if a student is in a semester course, they did the first 10 weeks in one model, they did the remainder of the school year in the second model, uh, we would work, that is a logistical challenge for us and that's part of the planning, that's why some of the stuff will take some time. Um, we would work to try to make sure that the student would get credit for the course. If this is a situation, however, where someone makes a switch with the model and they started the class, uh, and maybe they were an in-person student and they shifted to hybrid and that class was no longer offered, um, that's a situation we would have to problem solve. There is the potential that um, we might we might have to get creative in order to help get the student credit for that. Um, but I would imagine those situations would be uh, at a minimum. Thank you, Matt. Uh, the next one is there should be an option in the survey to leave status quo. So what I referenced is we added some questions to it. One of the questions we added was a temperature check. How are things going for you? Uh, and you can answer that for each of your children that go here if you have more than one ch child. The students can answer it themselves, the staff can answer it. And the reason we put that in there is because, you know, 90% of the people say it's going well. Um, that may need to, that may lead us to say, we need to come back together and have a conversation as a, as a community. Um, that maybe, maybe we do need to ride this out. Um, but at the same time, I know there's a, a lot of people that also feel like, you know, things aren't going well and we need to, we need to get back to in person. My students, my, my child's struggling academically, socially, emotionally. Um, everybody's in a different situation. And we're trying to be responsive to um, make decisions that, that help our community uh, the most. And, uh, and the hard part is, like I said, is no matter what we decide, it's not going to, it's gonna make people angry. Um, there's just a no-win situation. Uh, the next question is, um, have you considered uh, four feet of distance? Maybe, three, maybe we're not ready for three feet. And what I would tell you is we'll space students out as far as we can as the classrooms will allow. And some rooms are big and four feet is doable. But we also have some rooms where three feet is barely doable. Um, we have a variety of different classroom sizes. And so if we said as a whole, we had to be at four feet, we would not be able to even have this conversation right now. Uh, we don't have a large enough space to be able to maintain four feet in all rooms and be able to reopen. Next question is, will virtual primary students have all day Zoom or will it continue to be small Zooms throughout the day? 
Yeah, the virtual model won't change much other than adding the additional day. So in terms of how it's structured, whatever you're currently experiencing, we would expect that same structure to continue. And that's been pretty purposeful that teachers might do some direct instruction, but then release the students to maybe work a bit more independently so it doesn't feel like they're consistently on Zoom. And even for our, our students at the secondary level, um, you know, they are engaging with the courses and going from class to class to class throughout the day. But even within that, our teachers are trying to be as purposeful as possible to design that time so that there is some direct instruction, maybe an opportunity for independent work and application, maybe even some collaboration using breakout rooms, but then maybe a chance to come back together full group and wrap up the class. So uh, we're not anticipating any significant changes there. Thank you. I think I have the next couple. Okay. The state guidelines and data says that it's safe to attend school full time. How long does the district plan to allocate resources for virtual learning? I'm so glad you asked this question. In fact, the only reason we're allowed to offer virtual learning right now is the state government changed laws to allow us to do it. And we can only do it at this time, this school year. And so we intend to offer it throughout the school year. Now, if I was a betting person, I'm going to bet that that is extended into next year. And we will have to have a conversation as a district. Do we continue to offer a virtual option uh, next school year? Now, I could be completely wrong. They may not extend it. There is a thing called seat time that districts have to submit. And seat time literally has to be student time in our building. This year, they removed student time in our building and, and qualified virtual learning and equivalent work to in a virtual setting as seat time. Uh, and so, like I said, we will dedicate resources to it through this year, and then we'll see what the governor does in, in terms of the law and whether or not he allows it to happen next year. And if he allows it to happen next year, we'll have to revisit whether or not we'll be able to provide it. Um, from a student psychological perspective, what study or evidence have I seen that shows we are not already past the point of return for students to not be disrupted by a change to full week in person? And the only thing I could say to that is, the situation we're in, I don't believe there's studies that exist that would tell us that one way or another with confidence. And I sure wish there was a handbook that I could follow right now. And it tells me to turn left or turn right and to do this or to do that. What I'm trying to do is design something that's responsive to our community and the different um, requests that I'm hearing from staff, students and parents alike. Uh, the air conditioning piece, you want me to take this since I'm knee deep in capital project? Good. <laughs> yeah, so it's interesting. Air conditioning, some of the scientific research is saying that air conditioning is not good for COVID. It actually helps spread COVID. So we are going to have to tackle that um, very soon. Uh, and, and we're already having conversations about how do we handle that. If you may recall in the fall, uh, we didn't use our air conditioning uh, because the science showed that it helped spread the aerosols and COVID. Um, that being said, in our capital project, we are ex expanding AC a little bit into larger spaces like auditoriums, libraries, and places like that where students can get relief um, during a hot day. And, and I'm talking outside of COVID and outside of masking, uh, but that is a complex piece is on hot days wearing a mask is very uncomfortable. And at the same time, running an air conditioner is said to not be good to control the spread of COVID. And so these are the contradictory pieces we're trying to work through. I think you may have covered the next question, Jamie, about asking the question about maintaining current status. I think we have included that as an option as part of the survey. So I think we're good there. Next question, will you please clarify why some classes may be dropped at the high school level? Would it be based on the size of the in-person class? Actually, the dropping of the course would have it have more to do with if you switched between the two models. So. If you were a hybrid student and you had access to a certain, uh, or you're an in-person learning student working in the hybrid model and you were taking a course, that same course may not be available to be taught by a virtual teacher. So those would be the situations where you may be dropped from a course, uh, not because of class size or something along those lines. If we have a large influx of students, let's say shifting from virtual to hybrid, we might have to divide out some of those courses, but that doesn't mean you lose the course. You might have to split students up if it, for some reason we have a particular course that is too large and in that instance we may need that virtual teacher to uh, work in a different capacity or think about uh, our staffing allocation to ensure that a, an additional section of that course runs as opposed to asking somebody to drop it. Thanks Matt. 
Uh, the next question is thoughts about reducing class size in the younger grades the next few years to help with social emotional development and maybe um, recover some learning gaps. Uh, it is a constant conversation that we have. Uh, ideally, at the primary level, our class sizes would be a, a tad smaller. The difficulty is, uh, although we have all these federal dollars coming in, they're one-time monies. And you know, I was an administrator that lived through the last recession, 08, 09, that lasted multiple years, and we had to cut incredible amounts of staff. We are primed for that again. The state is pulling back money, and the federal dollars are coming in fast and furious. In fact, right now we believe the state won't pull back money. We have all this federal money coming in and the state money may be staying level, but the federal money is only lasting a year or two and gone. And it's going to leave this massive millions of dollars gap that really um, will devastate districts if our state doesn't come up with a solution to backfill. And so um, that being said, yes, you know we do believe at the primary levels having lower class sizes is an important thing and it's something we'll continue to evaluate and try to make happen but we also have to be mindful of our finances because um, you know, long-term sustainability is important. And yes, aides would need to adjust their times if we go back full time in some instances. I don't wanna say that broad and sweeping because that maybe doesn't include all of them, but yes, we adjusted your times a bit this year where your Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday are a bit longer, your Wednesdays are a bit shorter and we needed you to help with dismissal and things like that and arrival. And so um, those things would need to, to adjust in all likelihood. Next question is, uh, what if kids aren't overly social with friends or with other students? We, we had this conversation even as recently as today. Um, we give some thought to assign seating for kids um, that, you know, we don't want them to feel left out or, or isolate because, you know, it's, the cafeteria uh, is, is a challenging place, so let's say, to navigate for perhaps some of our younger students. Uh, yeah, and I, and I think to that point, yeah, we, we, we very much want to give some consideration to how we carefully handle that. Um, if we go, are in a situation where um, we're moving more toward having students at, at desks versus at larger tables, um, it, you know, we'll, it'll be a situation where I think we have to take a look very carefully about how we decide where students are placed. Um, and it, it'll be a situation too that, you know, tables um, is kind of a setting that might cause us to, uh, that might be more complex for students to navigate. If students are at desks and kind of spread out any, which is a lot of what's happening currently, um, that that's that that's one thing that will probably continue for a lot of kids. The other piece is students at the primary level, the primary elementary level also have been eating in classrooms. Um, and so with that set up, um, it, there's there's the strong possibility that they still would, would remain with their peers if in fact uh, we're thinking uh, as we finalize plans for how we're going to tackle the, the lunch piece um, given that we'll need additional guidance we'll have to think about the distancing components um, we will have to think very carefully about how to make sure that we take that under consideration when making seating determinations for kids jamie i don't know if you want to add anything in, in particular to that. no that's something we we're concerned about we do not want kids feeling left out this is a difficult enough time and that's part of the reason why we have been reluctant to say yeah parents select your group or cohort, um, because that will inevitably lead to hard feelings and kids feeling left out. And we, you know, th that's of utmost importance right now, certainly, always. Um, what if we need busing in the afternoon, not in the morning? Will the survey have that level of detail? It will. So you pick AM, PM, both, uh, drop off locations, things like that, it's all in there. It's a great question. Uh, do you want to get the next one um, yep. with the yep. special ed services? If my student goes full-time in person, will special education services be available in person or will they stay remote? Um, I think this question is relationship to perhaps one of our staff members working remotely currently and delivering some of those services. Uh, there is the potential that um, depending on the service and depending on the staff member who's delivering that service, there is the potential that it could stay remote. Um, and, and, but it, there's also the, an equal amount of potential that it could shift to being in person. So uh, I think when we, when we think about the related services for our students, uh, we are gonna have to try to balance uh, our current staffing and the delivery model that, of which we're able to provide for a student based on, is there a change or you know, did they stay within the current model? There could be some, some shifting there, but there's also the potential that some of that um, service could still be delivered uh, either remotely by a staff member or via teletherapy or, or other means. Uh, thank you. And then um, last two here. Uh, if there is there any information on what the governor's office is waiting on to make a final decision about the CDC? 
I wish. Um, actually, the, because they're so unresponsive um, to request questions that are being asked about, I've actually gone about the route of connecting with reporters and feeding them questions to ask the governor and his pressers when he allows reporters in. And as you know, he's very rarely doing that anymore. Um, but uh, one of the reporters that I've been in communications with did ask the question just the other day. And um, it was incredibly disappointing that the, the governor really didn't seem to have any idea what was in the CDC guidance and had to refer to a member of his team to answer the question. Uh, it was not what I was expecting um, at all. And so I don't know what it is. I do believe there's a little bit of a, a power play. Um, I don't know how else to say it in that um, the governor, governor Cuomo needs some wins right now. And uh, I think he wants to be the one who reopens schools. And when local departments of health across the state have tried it, it hasn't gone over well um, from the governor's office perspective. And so, uh, you know, I don't know what's holding them up right now. It's, it's incredibly frustrating. Uh, you know, we can't get any response from anybody out of his office. Um, everybody locally that's a re representative, representative of his office is on board. You know, they, they see what we're trying to do and are, are being supportive. They want to help, but they're getting no help from Albany right now. And so I, I wish I had a better answer for you. I watch every one of his press conferences and they're not fun. Um, and then very rarely do I leave it feeling like I learned something, um, but I don't wanna miss anything either. And so uh, we're trying to stay up to date on everything and learn what we can. And then uh, the last question, are we committed to our choices on tomorrow's survey or will there be another one sent? So we're asking you to commit your, to your choices, but at the end of the day, if the way it shakes out and the schedule you receive doesn't work, we would ask you to call the building administrator and uh, discuss what other options you have. Um, you know, it's very difficult on our organization. It's very taxing on our group. We have very limited flexibility. And so if people keep switching back and forth, it may cause us to not be able to make all this happen. Uh, but we do want to accommodate people. We do want to be a service organization. We'll do everything we can to accommodate you if you need to switch. Um, but, you know, I can't, I can't guarantee it. We'll just try our very best though. And so far we've been able to, we've been able to do it. We did it, Matt. We did it. We made it through all the questions. Good. About four hours of um, forums today and a couple last night. So uh, thank you everybody for sticking with us. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for being um, so uh, respectful uh, in your line of questioning. I really do appreciate everything. Um, but anyway, uh, I wish you well. If you have questions, reach out, stay safe, and uh, we'll stay in touch. Please read those Friday communications. We'll put a lot of information in there as well. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Take care.